Minister. Thank you, Senator Stirl. Your Association. time has expired. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move to question time, and I'm calling Senator Bragg. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister representing the Treasurer, I should say, Senator Gallagher. How are you? Uh, that's good. I'm very pleased to hear that. Uh, given the higher than expected inflation rate announced today, will the government commit to limiting spending growth below inflation? Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I thank Senator Bragg for the question and for remembering there's other people in the chamber, other ministers that can answer questions. Um, yes, uh, look, uh, I've just been looking at the um, inflation figures that have uh, been released today, the monthly inflation figures, and um, uh, the rate of 6.8 per cent in the month of February, which is uh, lower than the 7.4 per cent rate reported in January 2023. But I don't think it's any surprise, and I've been saying for some time in this chamber, that one of the significant challenges facing uh, the budget and the decisions that we are taking in relation to the budget is um, how we uh, deal with the inflation challenge, uh, how we provide sensible cost of living relief where we can without adding to the inflation challenge across the economy. Um, and that requires us to show some restraint um, where we've got uh, revenue upgrades to look at how we um, bank those upgrades. And as um, you know, in October, we banked 99 per cent of those upgrades in the first two years, and I think it was 92 per cent over the four years. So that gives you an indication of the fiscally responsible way that we will go about uh, making these decisions. Uh, and we're doing that against a backdrop of increasing pressures on the budget, whether it be from defence, uh, from the NDIS, uh, from health, from aged care, from some of the terminating measures, the cleaning up the mess that uh, we are also working through and have been talking about in this uh, chamber this week. So, um, you know, you'll see the budget when it's released, but the question that Senator Bragg uh, asked of me is uh, certainly front and centre of the mind of all of all of us who participate through the ERC process. Thank you, Minister. Senator Bragg, first supplementary. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, following the tenth consecutive interest rate rise, the government has committed $45 billion in off-budget spending. How much of this will be spent in the next financial year? Minister. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Well, those uh, provisions were made in the October budget um, and have been uh, factored into the figures that were released uh, as part of the economic forecast for the October budget. Uh, obviously, we, uh, in relation to the NRF, um, that has passed the parliament um, with rewiring the nation. Uh, we are moving on that through the Powering the Regions Fund. Uh, when the Housing Australia Fund hasn't passed the parliament, um, and uh, so we won't be in a position uh, to establish that fund um, over, you know, until that passes the parliament. Uh, there will be some expenditure, I would imagine, once those funds are up and running. Um, I'm, I'm, we'll report that in the normal way, uh, as you would expect, uh, once those decisions have been taken. But I would say that the actual um, provision for those has been factored into the budget and the economic forecasts outlined in October. Thank you, Minister. Senator Bragg, second supplementary. Thanks very much. Uh, Minister, did the International Monetary Fund find that off-budget spending items like the National Reconstruction Fund fuel inflation and should be avoided. Why won't the government follow the IMF's advice? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and I thank Senator Bragg for the question. I don't have the IMF uh, uh, report in front of me, but I think those opposite have. Um, well, I don't want to say they've verbal the, um, the IMF, but I think they have used the IMF report for political, to to try selectively for political purposes. Uh, I think my recollection of the IMF's um, from the IMF's um, report was that they talked about um, being mindful of the impact of establishing funds and being cautious about the use of them, and that's exactly what we were, we were doing. 
Uh, and in fact, if we go back and have a look, um, when you were in government, you established quite a number of, of those funds uh, in a similar way that we are doing now, and we are using them to drive a common good, whether it be in housing, whether it be in manufacturing jobs, or actually ensuring we've got an energy grid that actually works um, for the renewable energy future that Australia will uh, have thank to you, have. Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Stewart. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry and Science, Senator Farrell. Yesterday, members of the government and the crossbench came together to support the passage of the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill in this place. It was a great win for manufacturing. Can the minister outline how the passage of the NRF will support Australian manufacturing? Minister Farrell. Thanks, uh, <coughs> Thanks uh, President. And it's good to get some questions, at least from my own side. Um, <laughs> The other, the other side seemed to have given up on me. But, um, you outlasted them, Don. I know you've you got a great. I know, I know, I know you've got a great interest great in uh, rebuilding Don's manufacturing uh, in this uh, in this country. And last mm -hmm. night, the Senate passed the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill, and this is one of the largest investments in manufacturing in Australia's history. Uh, this is the Albanese Labor government's first step in rebuilding Australia's industrial ca capability. And I was pleased to see uh, Senator Colbeck uh, last night picking up on this very point and making it on a number of occasions uh, so that we can be a country that makes things again. Australia should be a country that makes things. Australia must be a country that makes things because making things here will help secure Australia's future prosperity and drive sustainable economic growth. The National Reconstruction Fund will leverage Australia's natural and competitive strengths by providing finance to projects in priority areas. It will make investments in projects that will support, diversify and transform Australia's industry in agriculture, forestry and fisheries, in resources, in transport, in medical science, in renewable and low uh, emissions technology, in defence capability and enabling uh, um, capabilities. The uh, National uh, Reconstruction Fund will revitalise and strengthen our local supply chains yeah. to ensure that we have our own industrial and manufacturing capabilities. It will invest in businesses so that they can invest in their workers developing the skills that we need now and into the future. Uh, we got to this point by working together with the crossbench, and I congratulate them, because when the coalition stepped back, the crossbench uh, had Thank to you, step Minister. Up. The time for answering has expired. Senator Stewart, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Our government actively engaged with the Greens and the crossbench on the legislation. And following this engagement, the Senate agreed to a number of amendments to the bill. How will the amendments to the bill help create a stronger future for Australian industry? Thank you, Senator Stewart. Um, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and thank uh, Senator uh, Stewart once again for her uh, very salient uh, question. Uh, the amendments the government uh, made to the bill addressed a number of other important matters that have informed our design of the National Reconstruction Fund, fund from the outset. Uh, attracting private sector investment, not crowding it out. Achieving Australia's greenhouse gas emissions reductions target and decarbonisation. Creating secure jobs and a skilled and adaptable workforce. Enhancing resilience in Australia's supply chains and, of course, encouraging the commercialisation of Australian innovation and technology. In making these amendments, the government reaffirms that one of our um, most important outcomes of the National uh, Reconstruction Fund will be the creation of secure, well-paid jobs in key industries that build on our national strengths. Uh, Senator Stewart, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Labor is actively working with industry and workers to rectify the economic mess left by the former government. How will the passage of the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill help create secure jobs in this country? Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, uh, and thank you, uh, uh, Senator Stewart, again for your uh, prescient uh, question there. Uh, when we uh, proposed the uh, National Reconstruction Fund in March 2021, Labor said we were going to do this to rebuild secure work. Because uh, we know a strong domestic manufacturing industry provides opportunities for Australians to make a meaningful, 
high-skilled contribution to our nation's future. Nearly 85 per cent of jobs in manufacturing are full-time, and it's a shame that the coalition didn't get this message. They were opposed to creating new jobs in their communities. They were opposed to local manufacturers, just like they were opposed to the car industry in, uh, in this country. <clears throat> the only jobs they're ever interested in are jobs for their mates. Uh, with the passage of the National Reconstruction Fund, the Albanese Labor government will create job, uh, job communities that uh, can be built around, especially in regional, remote and you, outer Minister. suburban the Australia. Thank you, Minister. time has expired. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. The October budget forecast a 56 per cent increase in electricity bills for Australian households over the next two years. Does the government believe the actual increase will be higher or lower than forecast? Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Minister Gallagher. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, thank you. Well, we will update, we will update the figures. Um, we will update the figures uh, in the budget in the normal way, as we do. Uh, they were released in October. They will be updated uh, in May. Uh, and uh, I would remind the chamber that the efforts that we put in place to reduce yep. those unacceptable increases in electricity prices caused by a decade of delay, dysfunction and failure to land 22 energy policies. 22, released them all, didn't land one of them. So after creating the problem, then hiding the problem before the election, we're now in the world Order. where you stand in the way of any solution to this. Indeed, in, in December, when we did bring forward, I've already answered your question. Oh. Um, Minister, resume your seat. Senator Colbeck. It, it was a point of order on direct relevance. Does the government believe the actual increase will be higher or lower? Um, Senator Colbeck, uh, the minister is being relevant to your question. Minister Gallagher, please continue. Uh, thank you. And uh, I answered the question, um, President, when I, I did. I answered the question when I said those figures will be updated in the normal way. Senator Colbeck obviously wasn't listening when I directly answered his question when I first got to my feet. But I would also say that the efforts we took in recalling the parliament based on those, um, on those results in the October budget to put downward pressure on those increases was opposed by those opposite. So the gall of you to come in here and say and, and feign concern over electricity prices when you oppose the Order. legislation Order. that put in place the parameters that put Order. downward pressure on those prices. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, I have called the chamber to order three times and you kept interjecting extremely loudly. That is disrespectful and disorderly. When I call the chamber to order, it includes every single person in this place. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. I must say I am finding the level of interjections towards me quite confronting uh, this question time. Uh, I, feel, I feel very affronted by it. Uh, so thank you for your protection. Uh, but the gall, the gall of these people. Oh, Senator Order. Henderson, is that you yelling at me? Uh, Minister, oh, the gosh. time has expired. Order, uh, Senator Henderson. Senator Watt. Order across the chamber. Uh, Senator Colbeck, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Why did the government break its promise made on no, at least 97 occasions prior to the 2022 election to cut, the, to cut electricity bills by $275? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, the government uh, is getting on with implementing the Powering the Nation plan, which we took to the election. The legislation that's currently before the chamber and has been debated uh, into the early hours of this morning and, and through the day is part of that. Uh, that is about dealing with the significant challenges we have in transitioning to a renewable energy uh, superpower, that we would like to be, uh, which we will do without your help. 
uh, to ensure that we are moving to renewables, that we're rewiring the grid, that we're supporting households with the transition, that we're supporting jobs in the transition, that we're supporting regions in the transition, that it's an orderly transition, or as orderly as it can be after a decade of delay and dysfunction from those opposite. That's what we're doing. We're doing exactly what we said we would do. And where we're dealing with the challenges of the day, like a war in Ukraine that's increased uh, prices around the world, we're dealing with that despite the opposition from you. Thank you, Minister. Senator Colbeck, second supplementary. Thank you. I'll try again. Why did the government break its promise, made at least 97 occasions prior to the 2000, uh, 20, 2022 election, to reduce electricity bills by $275. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Minister. Senator Colbeck refers to the Powering Australia plan, which we are implementing. So I reject uh, the assertion being put forward by Senator Colbeck. And I would similarly say to those opposite, why did you hide the electricity increase before the election? What was that about? Was it because you didn't want to tell Order. people? Was it because the member for Hume actually didn't want people to know that under your watch, with, with um, all of the energy leaving the system and not enough being replaced, that when you got confronted with the news that there was going to be a significant increase in electricity prices, what did the member for Hume do? Well, he hid it. He hid it until a few days after the election. We are being upfront with the Australian people where there are challenges, and we've seen them, and we saw them in December, we saw them in the budget. We responded responsibly and carefully, and all you did, all those opposite did, was oppose it, just like they oppose everything else we do. Thank you, Minister. Senator Faruqi. My question is to Minister Watt, representing the Minister for Education. Minister, every week I hear heartbreaking stories about students struggling to put food on the table, pay for medicine, afford a train or a bus ticket, pay bills or to pay rent. One 19-year-old Queensland University of Technology student says she has not eaten fresh fruit and vegetables for at least a month and relies on instant noodles. She struggles to afford period products. At UNSW, hundreds of students are lining up in queues for free food. This is causing intolerable financial stress and mental health impacts for students. Can you look these students in the eye and tell them that you can spare $254 billion for, for the wealthy and $368 billion for war machines and nothing for them? Uh, Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Well, I reject the suggestion that our government is doing nothing to assist students or low-income earners generally. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't that long ago that we came, brought the parliament back uh, to uh, support legislation, for instance, to support uh, price caps on uh, coal and gas uh, prices and provide energy price relief for low-income earners, including the very students that we're talking about. Um, we also, of course, the Albanese government, delivered cheaper medicines uh, starting on the 1st of January this year, which students, among others, would benefit from, pensioners, uh, many others would benefit from. As I recall, it was the first reduction in PBS uh, uh, um, prices that people were paying, uh, if not ever, in Australian history, then certainly for a very long time. Senator Rustin. Uh, and that is in addition to a much broader range of cost of living relief uh, that the government is providing. Now, one of the things that you pointed out um, Senator Faruqi, was that many of these students are renters, and I certainly remember my renting days as a student when you don't have a lot of money. And as I pointed out on a number of occasions this week to the Greens, there's a very simple thing that the Greens could do to assist uh, meet the need for more social and affordable housing in Australia, and that is to back the, the Housing Australia Future Fund that our government is putting forward. Um, the, the hypocrisy of the Greens is yet again on display when it comes to housing. On the one hand, they're out there claiming that we need more social and affordable housing. They're claiming that we need to see support for renters, that we need more housing for renters. And then when there's a government that's actually prepared to do something on this topic, what do the Greens do? They say, no, it's not good enough. They, bat, they vote against it again. So it is actually within your power to do something about this. 
about support for affordable housing to bring down the cost for students, but instead you'd rather have a protest out the front and yell at people. That's not the way to help people. Thank you, Minister. Senator Faruqi, first supplementary. Minister, students are rushing from job to job, but still barely making ends meet. Nearly a third of students work more than 20 hours a week. They are telling us it is impossible to just be a student and enjoy uni life anymore because they can barely afford to live. Too many students are living in poverty. Will the Labour government show people they are, that there, ha, there has actually been a change of government and raise the rate of income support payments to at least $88 a day? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President, and thank you again, Senator Faruqi. Uh, again, I've already listed a range of ways that our, the Albanese government is providing cost of living support to support uh, a range of lower income earners, including students. Um, and uh, again, some of the fundamental issues that, that cause student poverty, which is a real issue uh, and has been for a very long time in this country, one of the core, key causes of that is the extra cost that students are having to pay for accommodation. And again, the, the, it is within the Greens' power to do something about this. Maybe just for once, the Greens could think about being part of the solution to deliver on the things that they're complaining about, uh, rather than thinking much more about having a protest out the front where they yell at people and ask for things that can never be delivered by any government uh, in Australian history. Um, we do recognise that lower income earners need support need more support than they ever got under the coalition government, and that is exactly what we are doing. But in the meantime, the Greens should reverse their position and back our Housing Australia Fund to deliver Thank the you, housing Minister that is needed. Minister, the time has expired. Senator Faruqi, second supplementary. Minister, on 1 June, millions of Australians will, will be hit with more debt. Average student debt will balloon by almost $1,700. For others, it will soar by $3,000 and even $5,000. This means many more will be going backwards. They can't keep up because student debts are now going up faster than they can be paid off. Will the government intervene urgently to ensure that people are not hit with an obscene increase in their student debts on 1 June? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Uh, well, as Senator Faruqi may be aware, uh, Minister Clare, the Education Minister, has asked uh, his universities uh, and higher education accord team uh, to look at the issue of student debt. Uh, it's also important to explain the way that HEX and HELP works. It's not like a home loan or a personal loan from a bank where if the interest rates go up, then your payments go up. It's built on an important principle that people pay what they can afford and people don't pay more until, unless they earn more. That is the way that the system has always worked. And I remember Senator McAllister and I having debates about this when we were university students, about uh, student fees that should be, should be um, the, the right way of, uh, to charge student fees. It's been an issue for a very long time. I'm not sure we were on the same side necessarily, Senator McAllister, on that. Uh, <laughs> But, um, but we all grow and change our minds on things, even, even people like you and me. Um, but these are serious issues. The Greens should help. The Greens should help, and the Greens should provide more social and affordable housing, Thank which is you, what Minister. this Labor the government is doing. The time for answering has expired. Senator Pratt. Order in the chamber. Senator Pratt. President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister please tell us what key health services have been left with funding that expires on June 30 this year and what impact that expiry of funding would have on crucial service delivery to Australians that rely on these very services? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, President. I thank Senator Pratt for the question and for a, a uh, a rare question on health uh, in this chamber, um, but we know after almost a decade of cuts and neglect from those opposite, it's never been harder or more expensive to see a doctor. Our government is being upfront with Australians about the state of our health care system because this crisis just didn't spring from thin air or happen overnight. It's the result of decisions made by the former government, a former government whose priority was to cut Medicare. Instead of funding critical health programs, they chose to put hundreds of measures, hundreds of measures in the budget on a timeline to be cut. For example, the My Health Record System, a system that looks after the health records of 23 million Australians, runs out of funding on the 30th of June this year. 
No money. No money from my health record. 23 million Australians health record. Just switch the money off. No money. No money for public dental. Adult dental services beyond the 30th of June. Do those opposite honestly think that adults will not have dental problems on the 1st of July this year? Because that is really the reason why you would budget for them in this way. Remember, and we shouldn't be surprised, because the Leader of the Opposition, I think he was voted the worst health minister in 35 years, off a poll of 1,100 doctors. 1,100 doctors because he wanted to put in place a GP tax, he wanted to increase the price Order. of medicine, and he even Order. wanted emergency departments to start charging for seeing Order. people. That is what we had under those opposite, and we're getting around cleaning up the mess that's been left behind. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Pratt, first supplementary. How is, how is the Albanese government different from the former coalition and Liberal government in its approach to responsible budget management? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, we are working through all of these uh, unfunded programs that are ongoing. It has created significant pressure on the budget, which is precisely why they were uh, dealt with in this way, to make the budget look better than it actually was by having ongoing programs terminate and not impact in the later years of the forward estimates. So we are working through those. Uh, but we also know that when it comes to health care, it wasn't a priority for the former government. They, they stopped the indexation of uh, GP visits for six years. And that is what has led to a lot of the crisis facing primary care. We are seeing GP surgeries close. Uh, we're seeing the GPs close around the country. People are finding it harder to get in, and when they do get in, they are paying more for seeing that doctor because of the crisis that was uh, factored in over a long period Thank of time. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Pratt, second supplementary. Can the minister explain how the Albanese government is making health care more affordable and rebuilding the trust of Australians in the management of our budget? Thank you, Senator Minister. Uh, and I thank Senator Pratt for the question. And I can inform uh, the Chamber of what we're doing because we are cleaning up the mess, working through carefully, methodically, all of the programs uh, that term that terminate. And we did do. I know you hate the fact that we went through line order. by line. We did go through line Minister, by line. Minister, please resume your seat. I'm waiting for order. Minister, please continue. Thank you. We started that line by line work in October and we are continuing to go through it. As problems emerge, as departments bring forward their terminating programs, we are working through those. But we are also and implementing our policies we took to the last election to invest in the health care of Australians. So, uh, for example, lowering the price of medicines came in on the 1st of January making a difference on the cost of living for millions of Australians. The Strengthening Medicare Task Force, which has a, sig a significant budget Senator to invest Rustin. in Medicare, and we're getting on with the job of investing in the, and opening those 50 urgent care centres. This is what you do when you're a government that believes in Medicare and believes Thank in you, the strength of the Senator health. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Um, Senator Wong, in question time of September 2022, I asked you a question in relation to immigration. In response to the question, you said Labor had increased immigration to 195,000 per year as a consequence of capacity constraints in the economy. Will the minister please explain to the Australian people why Labor has let immigration blow out to a record 650,000 this financial year and the next, as reported in The Australian today? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. Well, can I first thank Senator Hanson for the question? If she will permit me, can I say how lovely it is to be back? Uh, and to, to thank uh, those, uh, thank everyone who sent me good wishes. Oh, fair, fair uh, <laughs> Minister Wong. I thought you liked me. Senator Hanson. Order. No, Senator the minister asked if I permit her. I don't permit her. Uh, I've got only two minutes Senator for an Hanson, answer, and I want an answer, not about seat. how well. Resume your seat, Senator Hanson. Resume your seat. Uh, I think the minister is going to your question. 
do, I do indeed, endeavour to answer your question, Senator Hanson. Uh, I did want to just acknowledge the, the work of those behind me, particularly uh, Senator Farrell, who I think did very well uh, in my absence. Uh, I think what I, my response to you, Senator Hanson, was to refer to the net overseas migration figures. Uh, I am advised that the uh, increase in net overseas migration is 304,000 for the year ending September 2022. Uh, there is also an increase in planned permanent migration in 2022-23, which of course is a commitment from the Jobs and Skills Summit. I'd make the point, uh, and I assume uh, my answer to which you're referring uh, may, was making the same point, that we obviously do have some capacity constraints in the Australian economy. Uh, and in fact, ensuring that we have an appropriate level of, uh, particularly of permanent migration, is one of the ways we can grow our economy and one of the ways in which we can ensure uh, that um, some of those capacity constraints driving inflation are dealt with. Uh, I'm sorry, Senator Rennick? Senator Rennick. <laughs> There's a reference to... Um, <clears throat> Uh, so, so what I would say to you, Senator Hanson, is that uh, this government, uh, in its approach to net overseas migration, will always be guided by the national interest. And there will obviously be uh, a balance of questions that the government has to address, which both go to skill shortages, but also some of the issues that we've been discussing for some weeks now, including availability of housing supply. Uh, but uh, the government will always make decisions in migration in the national interest. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Hanson. Labor's Housing Future Fund plan to build 30,000 new homes in the next five years will obviously do nothing to alleviate Australia's housing and rental crisis in light of the fact approximately 700,000 homes are needed. Minister, will, when will Labor finally commit to making the massive cuts to immigration necessary to reduce demand for housing so that Australians already living here can have a home rather than living in their cars, tents or even on the streets? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. Uh, well, uh, I, again, I thank Senator Hanson for the question. and I would make the point that one of the reasons the government wants to bring forward the Housing Australia Future Fund uh, is, is to ensure the Housing Australia Fund is to ensure that we can contribute to greater supply. And it is, uh, I think, uh, very deeply concerning that in the face of some of what is occurring in the housing sector, that we have the coalition, those opposite, who I know are struggling with the reality of opposition, uh, very angry, uh, uh, very angry, as can be de as as is evinced by the sorts of interjections we get. Uh, simply saying no, and the Greens saying it's not enough, and as a consequence, there are people in this country uh, who would be benefited by uh, increasing housing supply, uh, which. Uh, may be left wanting. Uh, of course, always, always more can be done, Senator Hanson, uh, and I think we all understand that. Uh, and as I said, these are some of the Thank issues you, Minister, that the, the government will grapple with. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Hanson, second supplementary. At least I congratulate you on attempting to answer the question and unlock, like um, Senator Farrell, who didn't have much to say. On the Sunrise Order. program this morning, uh, David Koch Senator Hanson, Senator Hanson, please resume your seat. Order. I am not able to hear Senator Hanson's question because of the disorder and noise in the chamber. Senator Hanson, if you wouldn't mind starting the actual question again, please. On the Sunrise program this morning, David Koch interviewed a 16-year-old boy named Caleb who, with his father, has been forced to live in, in a tent in a Brisbane park because they cannot find rental accommodation. What message do you offer homeless teenagers like Caleb while your government makes the housing crisis worse with record high immigration. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, first, in relation to Senator Farrell. My observation of Senator Farrell was outstanding while I was away. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm very grateful. I was very grateful, very grateful for Order. his leadership, as I'm sure Order. all of my colleagues are. Uh, Senator, Senator Hanson, what, what I would say uh, is, is this, that uh, if, if, we, if people in this chamber are really concerned uh, about housing, uh, then they would stop their opposition to our housing fund. 
Uh, they would recognise that e even if they don't agree with all aspects of government policy. Oh, Senator Hanson. Relevance. We're not talking about the housing and backing the opposition backing government policy. I asked what her message is to Kaleeb um, about these. Uh, what message is she going to give to this uh, teenager? Senator Hanson, uh, Minister Wong is being relevant to your question. Minister, please continue. Well, my message is yes, we do need to increase the supply of housing. This government went to the election with a very clear policy, a set of policies around increasing the supply of housing, because we on this side of the chamber care about. Uh, pop, about uh, social housing, we care about improving access uh, to decent housing, and we care about what is happening in the rental market. And we understand that one of the key ways in Minister, which government can do that has is to please resume your seat, Minister uh, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. On Monday and again today in question time, the minister criticised terminating funding for my health records. Uh, given this somewhat pious grandstanding, why, didn't the minister, why did not the minister address this in Labor's budget last October, for which the minister claimed that she went through every single budget item line by line? Uh, thank you, Senator Reynolds. Minister. Thank you. Order. Order. Thank you, President. Order. Stop yelling at me. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Please resume your seat and wait for silence in the chamber. Senator Watt, I just called the chamber to order. Uh, Minister Gallagher, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Reynolds for the question. And I is this uh, the best that they've got, that the terminating measures that they put in the budget, the only criticism is that we didn't get to the hundreds of terminating measures, the hundreds, the booby Order. traps, the booby Order. traps, the funding cliffs, the zombie measures that you use to dress up your budget to make it look it was something that it wasn't. Order. Is the best that you've got is that we didn't deal with all of those messes, the entire mess that is the budget, the budget vandals that you had, is that it wasn't all fixed in October, that we didn't fix up all your messes in October. Well, I'll take that. We didn't, because there's so many of them. We dealt with the first bit in October. Just as we did with our spending audit, we did what we could in October Order. and we said we would come back and look at this through the budget in May. And that is what we are doing. But we are also highlighting the fact that those opposite booby-trapped the budget, dressed it up before an election, pretended that they were these fiscal, responsible fiscal managers, when at the very same time they were hiding pressures they had zombie measures in from 2016 that they still had in their bottom Senator line, Green. even though they were never going to get through this uh, Senate. $4.1 billion of mess in October that we cleaned up, and you will see more of us cleaning up the mess, more of the results of cleaning up the mess in May, because there was so much mess it couldn't all be done in the first economic Senator update. Um, Senator Reynolds, first supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, President. Uh, this Monday, the minister also criticised terminating funding for the Australian Radioactive Waste Agency, adding, do you reckon they might need ongoing funding to keep their programs going? Now, remember that, colleagues, because given the minister's grandstanding yet again, why didn't the minister address this in Labor's budget last October? For which, remember, what did the minister say? She had gone through the budget line by line. So uh, did you miss you, this Senator one Reynolds. too in your budget thank analysis? You, Senator, order. Order. I've called order. Senator Brown, I've called order. Uh, Senator, Minister, please resume your seat. Minister Scar. Uh, Senator Scar, I've just called order. Um, Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you very much. And can I thank Senator Reynolds for highlighting the mess uh, that they left us? Uh, 
I really appreciate it. I wanted, you know, I've been looking forward to Dorothy's on terminating measures. I didn't expect to get a Dorothy from Senator Reynolds on terminating measures. Uh, we went through uh, and made decisions uh, in the time we could for October. We were elected in May. We went straight into putting forward uh, the October budget. We did what we could. I think we indicated at the time that there was more work to be done and there will continue to be work to do be done as we uncover these issues, as agencies bring them forward through the processes of the budget and we deal with them because that's what responsible governments do. Responsible governments don't have zombie measures propping up their budget. Responsible governments don't uh, Fail to address pressures that are about to hit the budget. Uh, Responsible you, governments the do it the way we are doing. Has expired. Senator Reynolds, second supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, President. And uh, in light of all of your comments, the dog ate my homework. What have we got? We've got zombies. We've got booby traps. In light of all of your comments on terminating measures, can you guarantee now, in light of all of those comments, that the 2023-24 budget will have no terminating measure? And if not, why not? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Well, the point I'm making is about ongoing programs, ongoing programs that are clearly going to continue. Uh, there is a place. There is a no. Well, I'm answering Order. the question. Order. I'm answering the question that Senator Reynolds asked. There is a place for um, time-limited measures in a budget. Well, there are. For example, if there's a need to uh, fund Minister, something. Minister, please resume your seat. Order on my left. Order. Order. Are you? Uh, seeking a point of order, Senator Reynolds. Asian, could I just uh, ask? Senator Reynolds, resume your seat. I'm still waiting. Order. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. Well, those opposite will have to wait to see the budget, but I can tell you that they'll see a budget where responsible decisions have been made. Uh, about programs that are ongoing, where they've been underfunded, where they've been neglected, on my where left. they're being used as a way of propping up a budget to pretend those costs aren't coming, you will see the government working carefully to deal with those. And they are a significant pressure on the budget, and they will contribute to a significant expenditure Thank you, in fixing the time them up. For answering has expired, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, President. My question is to the uh, minister responsible for, well, acting for the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Uh, my question is regarding First Nations people targeted by UPLA funeral insurance. Uh, many who now cannot afford to bury their loved ones many of whom uh, are sitting in morgues. We've had elders sitting in morgues for two months uh, because of the scam uh, insurance company. The Albanese government, through your Minister of Indigenous Australians, committed to providing a resolution to those impacted by this scheme. Uh, and the October budget did include some money, but only uh, affected a small percentage of people which is now going to run out on November 30. When will the Labor government end the trauma and the suffering of tens of thousands of Aboriginal people who have been ripped off by this, by this scheme? I understand it's not in the May budget. Why not? Uh, thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and I thank Senator Thorpe uh, for the question about UPLA and um, the situation that um, thousands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families were left in the lurch when that um, funeral insurance scheme uh, collapsed. Uh, we have been working through all of the issues around um, providing, I think, support to those that have been affected. Um, as at the 17th of March 2023, the program has received uh, 220 applications, with 186 of these being approved. And the program has paid out 
$5 million in grants to 170 recipients to support First Nations families in conducting Sorry business. There are a small number of applications currently being processed or awaiting payment. The average processing time for an application from lodgement to payment is, taking, is about six weeks, and they are taking six weeks on average as we are dealing with a company that has collapsed and there are significant record keeping issues. So I would say um, to Senator Thorpe that we are working as fast as we can. Uh, we recognise um, this, you know, the very the awful situation many people many um, you know people have found themselves in with the collapse of UPLA, uh, and we are trying to work as hard as we can to make sure that we can resolve it for all of those that were being placed in this terrible position by the failure of this business. Thank you, Minister. Senator Thorpe, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. That's some small, if any, comfort to the elders sitting in morgues right now. Uh, 170 people you've you supported. We got more than what 10, 20,000 people that have been affected. Um, what solutions are you actually pursuing to get elders out of these morgues and ensure that a fair, enduring, and culturally appropriate resolution is reached for those for all of those impacted? Uh, thank you, Senator Thorpe. Um, Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, I, uh, uh, we are working as fast as we can, and we are acutely aware of the need uh, to resolve this as fast as we can. I would say to Senator Thorpe, uh, if there are uh, particular uh, families or individuals that you would like to um, advocate on behalf of, or are experiencing, you know, some, um, you know, a situation which might be we could assist with, then. Uh, I, I extend that offer on behalf of uh, the minister responsible, uh, but I can absolutely tell you the, the um, government has had a number of conversations about this UPLA and the collapse and what it means for those who have passed and their families, um, and that is why we've, we have moved as quickly as we could to provide assurance that we would deal with, um, with the families involved, including those that um, had passed away and were in morgues. Um, um, thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Thorpe, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for the invitation. I will take that up. Um, so, what do you say to those First Nations people who have lost their hard-earned money? Uh, as, you know, we heard today twenty-five thousand dollars has been gone from one family. Some of them now living in debt due to UPLA's collapse, debts that have been enabled and ignored by successive governments for over two decades. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Gallagher. Uh, yeah, look, well, that's why the government has sought to put in place arrangements to provide security to those families, acknowledging that we won't be able uh, necessarily to deal um, with all of the the trauma and um, difficulty and cost associated uh, with the money that's gone into those arrangements. I know that the Minister for um, the Assistant Treasurer, the Minister for Financial Services, is looking at um, you know other issues that had led to this um, the spruiking of these arrangements and and how it's being marketed. Um, but I would say again, I think the focus um, immediately on coming to government and getting the full briefing and understanding of what was happening and the fact that there hadn't been arrangements put in place to deal with it, the priority was to deal uh, particularly with those who had, um, who had loved ones, family members who had passed, and to make sure we put in place a suitable arrangement to deal with that. I would say the average number of days between an application being lodged and a payment Minister, being made time is 28 days has now. Expired. But Senator White. Senator White. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Senator Watt. We know it is, a fundament it is fundamental that our online world is a safe and inclusive environment. The eSafety Commissioner plays a key role in regulating the online world and achieving these objectives. What challenges does the eSafety Commissioner face in supporting the government's objectives? Thank you, Senator White. Minister Watt. Thanks, President. Sorry, Sen Sorry, Senator Henderson. Uh, order across the chamber. Order across the chamber. Senator Watt, I'll draw you to Senator Sorry, White. Sorry, Senator Henderson was just interjecting. I wasn't quite sure Senator what you were White's saying. Question. Um, I thank Senator White for the question. 
Recently, when I was in Darwin, my staff and I were following a land cruiser along the Esplanade that had a Do It For Dolly sticker on the back. It reminded me of the harrowing experience of Dolly Everett that no child should endure and the work that has been done since then to improve online safety. I do give the government former credit, uh, sorry, do give the former government credit, as does the Prime Minister, for the work they did in this space. And maintaining online safety is a core priority for the Albanese government. That's why we are supporting the eSafety Commissioner, Australia's independent regulator for online safety, particularly as the eSafety Commissioner undertakes critically important work to raise the bar for online safety and hold platforms to account for their actions to keep Australians safe. Whether it is online, tackling child sexual exploitation material, combating cyberbullying and harassment, or making dating apps safer, I think we can all agree that the work they do is absolutely critical for our society. However, despite the eSafety Commissioner's important role, I think senators would be astounded that eSafety has been operating without funding certainty thanks to decisions taken by those opposite. The fact is, sorry, Senator Henderson, are you interjecting? Right. Senator Watt. The, the fact is, eSafety has been relying Order. on non ongoing Order. or terminating funding. Sorry, uh, Senator McGrath. Sorry, Watt. interjecting. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senators, Senators, order. Order. Order across the chamber. Senator Wong. Or Senator H Henderson, order across the chamber. Minister Watt, please. Uh, Senator Henderson. I just wanted to put on the record that Senator Wong did Senator actually invite me to say Senator something on Henderson, the record. You know very about this well. matter. Senator Henderson, you, Senator Wong, you and every other senator in this place knows that it is disorderly to call out across the chamber. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, as I say, I think senators would be astounding that eSafety has been operating without funding certainty thanks to decisions taken by those opposite. The fact is eSafety has been relying on non-ongoing or terminating funding for years, and this was a deliberate design feature of the former Liberal and National Party government's budget policy. Can you believe that eSafety's base funding of $10.3 million has never been increased since eSafety was established in 2015? Thank you, and that's Mr. White. The time for powers answering every year. has expired. Senator White, first supplementary. Uh, we know that funding clips, uh, cliffs were a deliberate design feature of the Liberal National Government's budget strategy. What does the funding profile look like for eSafety going forward? Thank you, Senator White. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. Thanks, Senator White. After the 30th of June this year, it is astounding to know that thanks to funding decisions by the now opposition, eSafety and the eSafety Commissioner would face a funding cliff. In the Coalition's last budget, the overall funding for eSafety was forecast to drop Order. from $53.8 million down to $23.3 million, a more than 50 per cent decrease in funding to the eSafety Commissioner of our country. Like every budget announced in the last government, they went for short-term, non-ongoing measures and never addressed the structural underfunding of key agencies. Did the Coalition really think that once the clock turned over to the 1st of July this year, all the online exploitation material would just vanish from the internet? Did they really think that all of the misuse of dating apps, sorry, Senator Henderson, sorry, Senator Henderson, Senator um, that all Senator the misuse Henderson. of dating apps? Senator Henderson, I've called you to order about three times. Interjections across the chamber are disorderly and they're disrespectful. Minister Watt, please continue. Um, these are the funding cliffs that we find littered throughout the budget, even when it comes to important issues like e-safety, another you, mess Labor has to fix. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. As Senator White, second supplementary. Uh, Minister, I guess it's fair to say that Labor has been left to clean up the mess left by those opposite. Yeah. Uh, what is the Albanese Labor government doing to support online safety for Australians? Thank you, Senator White. Minister Watt. Thanks, Senator White. And you're right. I mean, all week we have highlighted examples 
uh, of the former government's deliberate design feature of funding cliffs throughout the budget in my own portfolios of agriculture when it comes to biosecurity, emergency management, e-safety, my health records. The list goes on and on and on, where this government thought that miraculously the whole world would change on the 1st of July and important permanent functions were not going to need ongoing funding. And this is another example of it. Uh, the Albanese government is now undertaking the substantive work to ensure that the Online Safety Act is successfully implemented, together with the eSafety Commissioner. eSafety has been undertaking important work in relation to the basic online safety expectations outlined in the Act. Recently, they issued a second set of reporting notices to seven digital platforms on the steps they are taking to tackle online child sexual exploitation material. Every day there will be new challenges that emerge, and the Albanese government is committing to, uh, committed to continuing the important you, work to make the online activity a safer Senator place. McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development and Local Government, Senator Watt. On 9 February this year, the minister categorically ruled out any changes to the diesel fuel rebate in the May budget. Will the minister also categorically rule out further delays to road and rail projects in the upcoming May budget? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator McKenzie. Um, again, we could have a discussion about the funding cliffs that were littered throughout the budget that was run by yourselves in agriculture and infrastructure uh, departments and things like that when it came to funding. But of course, all the future of all projects in, in the infrastructure portfolio will be revealed when the budget is revealed. Uh, and I know we're about to enter that period where we're going to see scare campaign after scare campaign from the opposition about what may or may not happen in the budget. Uh, we've actually got a government in place now that has uh, res a responsible budget practices rather than funding cliffs, rather than booby traps, rather than mirages uh, of, of, of back in black budgets that turn out to be not so back in black at all. Uh, we're not out there preparing coffee cups, uh, unlike uh, some. Thank you, Minister. Please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. Uh, on relevance, uh, Madam President, the Minister was, uh, he has already ruled in and ruled out uh, the diesel fuel rebate previously with respect to the May budget. My specific question was around further cuts and delays to infrastructure projects in the upcoming budget. Uh, thank you. And I believe the minister was being relevant. Um, minister, please continue. Uh, thanks, uh, President. Now, what I can say to add to the comments that I've already made is that the Albanese government is ensuring that infrastructure spending is targeted and aligned with current capacity and resource availability in Australia's construction market. And what I can always also tell you is that, unlike certain other people in this chamber and in this parliament, the Albanese government and our ministers will not be using colour-coded spreadsheets when it comes to allocating infrastructure funding. You won't be finding, you won't be finding reports from the Auditor-General about that kind of activity. Um, what we will actually be doing is allocating infrastructure oh, yeah. funding on the basis of need. And you know what? I know, I know it's a bit of a touchy subject over in that little part of the building. I know it's a touchy subject. Colour-coded spreadsheets and sports rorts and infrastructure rorts and regional rorts, uh, urban congestion rorts, car park rorts. I mean, there's just so many rorts you forget the numbers. Um, but this government actually takes using taxpayers' money seriously. Uh, we, we intend to use it transparently and honestly. And what that actually means is that we will fund projects that are not in Labor's seats. What an incredible suggestion that would be. What an incredible suggestion to have a government that is prepared to allocate money on the basis of need rather than on what colour they're coded on a spreadsheet. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKenzie, first up. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam President. The thin skin. On 1 March 2023, Minister for Infrastructure told the National Press Club that she wanted Infrastructure Australia to, and I quote, produce a more refined, more targeted infrastructure priority list. Will Minister Watt categorically rule out projects being cut from the infrastructure priority list in the upcoming May budget? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Minister Watt. Um, well, thank you, Senator McKenzie, for reminding us of the important institution that is Infrastructure Australia, an institution that was created by a former infrastructure of, minister of this country, a fellow by the name of Anthony Albanese. Uh, and the reason that Minister Albanese, as he then was, brought in Infrastructure Australia was to overcome the rorts of the infrastructure budget that we'd seen under the Howard government to bring back independence when it comes to decisions about infrastructure funding. I know um, it's a touchy issue. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator McKenzie. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. On relevance, again, to cuts to the budget for projects, the minister has gone nowhere near the question, either previously uh, or you. now. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Just, I'll just rule on the point of order, Senator Wong, unless you wanted to. No, it, um, if I could make this submission, um, President, the, 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 the senator herself referenced Infrastructure Australia. She can hardly complain when the minister utilises that reference in his response. He's clearly been directly relevant. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. Further to the point of order, and this goes back to the change that was made a number of years ago to the standing orders that shifted from answers to questions having to be relevant to answers to questions having to be directly relevant. And I submit, President, that a history lesson on the establishment of Infrastructure Australia just because Infrastructure Australia was mentioned in a question does not make it directly relevant. Order. Direct relevance actually requires turning to the substance of the question asked, not picking one or two words out of it for the convenience of the minister. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Order. 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 May I suggest to leaders that they allow me to rule on the point of order? Um, I was, uh, indeed, I was going to remind Senator McKenzie that the minister did reference uh, Infrastructure Australia, and I was going to draw the minister to the second part of your question. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. And I can assure Senator McKenzie and the entire Australian people that they can rely on the Albanese government to make targeted infrastructure investments in a fashion that we haven't been used to over the last 10 years. And as I was saying, it was the Labor government that invented uh, Infrastructure Australia to overcome the rorting of, ro of infrastructure budgets we'd seen from the Howard government. We've now had to restructure Infrastructure Australia because it had been distorted by the stacking with Liberal and National Party mates under the former government. There's a bit of a pattern here, isn't it? Every time there's a Liberal National government, it's stacking with mates, it's rorts. Every time Labor comes in, we have to clean up the mess and we're doing Thank it all you, over Minister. again. Um, Senator McKenzie, second supplementary. Oh, thank you. Um, can the minister categorically rule out any further cuts and delays to regional Queensland road projects to pay for the Albanese government's seven billion dollar Olympic Games venue deal with the Queensland Labor Premier? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Watt. Mm. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator McKenzie. Um, Senator Gallagher has reminded me that the funding that was going to be provided for Olympic infrastructure uh, that is going to be happening in the great city of Brisbane, in the great state of Queensland, where did that funding first come from, Senator Gallagher? Was there, was there some commitment made by the former government about that? Was it, I, I, was it the Liberal National Government that was going to contribute 50-50 funding Order. to the Olympics? Order. Or was it, so was it just the Liberals who supported the Order. Olympics infrastructure funding and not the Nationals? Or was it some of the Nationals and not some of the Liberals? I mean, re seriously, work out what page you're on. You're now up here asking us about funding uh, that your Watt. own government Minister committed Watt. to do. Please resume your Order. Order. Um, Minister Watt, please continue. Yeah. Senator Canavan, no, I have just called the chamber to order. And Minister Watt, please continue. Uh, and I am very proud of the fact that I, Senator Chisholm and Senator Green, played an instrumental role in making sure that the Rocky Ring Road project is going ahead uh, and, and, the, and the contractors have actually supported the actions. Uh, we had a few little people out there in their usual cosplay dress-ups outside the parliament who did absolutely nothing, and a few people have actually got to work uh, and got the you, job Minister. done. Thank you, Minister. Senator Wong. Order. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. If I could, if the chamber would indulge me, if I could just indicate, in you know, lovely news that while Senate question time was occurring, Senator Farrell's third grandchild arrived. Yeah. Uh, so welcome to the world, Leo, Leo Farrell Malika, and congratulations to Mary and Jones. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I'll just wait. Oh, Senator Farrell. Uh, can I thank uh, uh, Senator Wong for those very kind comments, but uh, also say that in question time yesterday, 
I undertook to provide further information in response to questions asked of me by Senator Van in my capacity as the Minister representing the Minister for Defence relating to the uh, Australian support for Ukraine. I've written to uh, Senator Van to provide additional information and I table my letter to Senator Van for the information of all senators. Well done. Answer your question. What are you talking about? questions to the government today. And it is absolutely unbelievable the way that you come in here and just blatantly lie to the Australian people, hiding behind your broken promises and trying to look backwards and rewrite a history that never occurred. Right, it is just that extraordinary one. that you seem to have forgotten that a pandemic occurred. You seem to have uh, just forgotten— Just a point of order, Senator Hughes. The, 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 the senator is experienced enough to know that she has to withdraw that. So, senator, senator Hughes, I didn't hear the comment, but um, on the advice of the clerk, could I just ask you for the benefit of the chamber to withdraw? Ah, uh, it was. All right. Can we just? This is not a conversation. I, the, the, I've had it relayed to me by the clerk that the phrase you, you the phrase you use with people cannot come in here and lie, which means it's a reflection on a group that people may have come and misled the, cha misled the chamber. So, for the benefit of the chamber, can I just ask? I you withdraw. Thank unlike you. some of my colleagues here, I will withdraw unequivocally. Uh, but I will say that. Uh, we come in here with an, a government who hides behind a litany of broken promises, uh, untruths told to the Australian people during the campaign, and come in here unable to either answer a question or, when they do utter a sentence in any form or format, uh, it is constantly heavy on politics, heavy on excuses and very short on a plan. And I may just like to point out to those opposite, for Australians who are about to come off their fixed mortgage rates, who are about to require around twelve to twenty thousand dollars a year, depending on the size of their mortgage, that when they're looking to this federal government to provide them with some guidance, a plan, cost of living support. All they are hearing from you is petty political point scoring that is actually based in falsehoods. That no one opposite remembers the pandemic. No one opposite remembers that our economy actually came out of the pandemic 3.4 per cent bigger than it was going into it. That the cash rate was 0.35 per cent. That we had lower unemployment coming out of the pandemic than we had going into it that we had strong G GDP growth and, in fact, we were one of the very few economies that maintained a AAA credit rating. So perhaps a history lesson is required and not even a particularly lengthy history lesson because it wasn't that long ago. It wasn't until you lot took the helm that the wheels completely and utterly fell off. But instead of putting together a plan, instead of doing some work, there's been a constant cry of government's hard and boo-hoo, we didn't get it right. But, you know, the fact that we heard from uh, the finance minister prior to the October budget, and, and just for those listening or any of those in the chamber, uh, this government actually has had a budget. Yeah. So when they talk about budget and they talk about issues in the budget, this is their budget that contains the issues because they've had a budget. It wasn't an economic forecast. It wasn't a statement. It was a budget with lots and lots of budget papers because we all got them delivered to our office and we all went through them and then we had lots of budget estimates. Uh, in follow-up to Labor's budget. Line line. But we did hear from the Finance Minister time and time again, and I'm not sure if it was 97 times, we might have to go back and check, because during the election we heard 97 times that power prices were going to go down by $275, but we now know that wasn't true, that's not going to happen, to the point of the fact when Senator Farrell was actually asked, can you just say the number 275, he declined. It's not that hard, people. But we don't know if the uh, finance minister said 97 times, but she said an awful lot that she was going through the budget with the treasurer line by line. 
line by line. So what does that mean? Does that mean she opened it up and flicked through and had a quick skim? We were told time and again that line by line this was going to be going through. So is it incompetence? Is it an ability to look into detail and understand what's written on the budget papers? How is it now that we have those opposite coming in and talking about mistakes they made in their own budget? Mistakes they made when they were the ones in charge on the Treasury benches, could not go through a budget, didn't know how to look at programs, didn't know what funding through to the forward estimates, which is actually, you know, this whole line you're all now wheeling out uh, of fiscal cliffs. I mean, we know that none of you sort of sat through Economics 101 for maybe more than half a lecture before it all got too hard, um, because that's the level of economic uh, comprehension that's demonstrated after day by day by those opposite. But terminating measures. Uh, they are a common tool used in a budget by responsible governments. It's just the way they work. Um, so I'm sure when we see in the May budget that those opposite may actually be employing similar methods, but when they do it, it'll be completely different because it's just the way the budget needs to be reported. No, it's the way budgets are done. And you have had your budget. Your budget was in October. You missed it. You goofed it. You got it wrong. You're not up to it. You can't get across the detail. And you know who's paying for this? The Australian people. And you're not giving them a plan. You're giving them excuses and petty politics than we saw from your front bench today. Senator Walsh. No, which uh, one? I'm happy to give either of you the call. Oh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you. Thank you, Senator uh, Ciccone, for your uh, generosity there. Uh, and uh, we, of course, welcome uh, the opposition's questions. You are indeed a gentleman, uh, Senator. Uh, we welcome the opposition's questions about our government's responsible approach to managing the budget, our approach to cleaning up the mess that was left behind from those opposite, uh, our approach to dealing with the trillion dollars of debt uh, that you left behind with absolutely nothing to show for it. Uh, we welcome your questions uh, about our approach to dealing with all of that while we get on with our plans to build a better, stronger future for all Australians. Uh, our plans to support Australians with the cost of living. Uh, our plans to deal with the energy mess uh, that was left behind after 10 years of complete denial and delay uh, from those opposite. Uh, our plans to build a strong and diverse economy, making more of what we need right here in Australia, an economy that is powered by cheap and clean energy, a decarbonising economy. This week, though, uh, and every week, what we see from those opposite, the former government, uh, is that you are all about saying no saying no to the good ideas that we took to the election, uh, saying no to the good plans that the Australian people supported at the election, um, no to safeguarding our climate, no to safeguarding jobs in regions in transition, um, no to even being part of the conversation about how we do that, um, no to rebuilding Australian manufacturing and making more of what we need right here, no to building more social and affordable homes for those in need. No to homes for 4,000 women and children escaping family violence. Can you believe that the coalition is saying no to that? No to funding for urgent repairs to Indigenous housing. No to capping power prices last year um, after they said no to telling the Australian people before the election that prices were indeed about to rise. Um, so right now, uh, the coalition has just been reduced to being the party of no. No to being a viable party of government, uh, no to even being a viable opposition. Uh, now we know uh, that inflation, uh, and we know from today's figures that inflation uh, is moderating, um, but that it is still high uh, and it's still tough for Australian families and Australian businesses. 
we really know um, that it is hard out there for people. Uh, and that's why our investments are so important. Um, investments in households, investments in industry, investments in the economy, uh, investments in the future of our country, uh, our investments in cheaper childcare, for example, our investments in cheaper medicines, our investments in fee-free TAFE, uh, and our investments in putting downward pressure on energy prices uh, and getting more renewables into our grid. Um, these measures are not only things that help households and businesses, um, they are also part of our plan to drive inflation down. Uh, and we've been talking this week as well about our plans to strengthen and diversify our economy, to rebuild manufacturing through the National Reconstruction Fund, a plan that is supported by everyone uh, except for the opposition, um, a plan that is all about creating the jobs of the future, a plan that's all about making more of what we need right here in Australia, a plan that is all about securing our supply chains uh, in critical sectors like medical manufacturing and defence. Um, it's all about making sure that we grab the job opportunities for the future for regions that are in transition. But who opposes that plan? The coalition. The opposition opposes that plan. They oppose the jobs of the future. They oppose jobs in regions. They oppose taking advantage of the jobs in renewables and in low emission technologies that we know are the future for our country. And they also oppose plans supported uh, by the rest of the parliament um, to uh, create the safeguard mechanism. Um, and this is a plan that industry supports, a plan that industry is keen to play its part in. Um, what people want is certainty, what they want is support, all they're getting from those opposite is no. Senator Nemper, Chippo Price. Yeah, um, I think Deputy uh, President. Um, yes, we hear a lot about plans uh, and we see very little action. And yes, we will continue uh, to oppose and say no to bad policy. We heard earlier Senator Colbeck, my colleague, asking Senator Gallagher about the October budget's forecast, a 56 per cent increase in electricity bills for Australian households over the next two years, and whether the government believed that the actual increase would be higher or lower than that forecast. Senator Gallagher, however, did not simply give an answer to the question, instead informing this chamber that the budget figures would be updated in May and then taking the opportunity to try and lay blame at the feet of anyone else. Telling us that the figures will be released at a later date is not answering the question, but then I don't expect anyone from the other side to answer any questions legitimately. Um, we still do not know whether the government believes that their October budget forecast is in fact accurate. Instead of taking responsibility for the decisions of the Labor government that have contributed to the rising cost of living for Australians now, Senator Gallagher and the Labor government would rather hide the answer from Australians and hide from their responsibilities. This has clearly become the norm for this government breaking promises and then hiding the details while throwing the blame at everybody else. But this government cannot continue to run from their broken promises. They cannot continue to try to lay the blame at the feet of past governments when their own policies simply do not work. At least 97 times before the election, 97 times the government promised that it would cut Australians' electricity bills by $275, and of course they cannot even bring themselves to say the number 275. But the government has not only been unable to deliver on that promise, they've also overseen price increases. They've overseen the contribution of massive pressure and stress on the budgets of Australian families and will continue to do so as they pursue their renewable energy utopia. The reality is 
that energy prices are predicted to continue to rise at brutal rates that will have real consequences for many everyday Australians come this winter. This is no doubt in part due to the Labor Green attack on cheap and reliable energy sources such as coal, gas and oil, sources of energy that will still be required to back up the green dream of 100 per cent renewables so that when the wind stops blowing and the sun goes down, Australians will still be able to heat their homes and live their lives. While Labor and Minister Gallagher said dreams of becoming a renewable superpower, Australians can continue to struggle with the extreme cost of their decisions. The reality is that renewable energy sources like solar and wind are not cheap. They are not reliable. They are not powering Australians into the future. They are expensive and add extreme cost and pressure to the grid and leave Australians vulnerable to energy poverty and related dangers. Labor needs to acknowledge this cost to the, transi to the transitioning and be upfront with the Australian people about the pressures that will come with it. Instead, the Labor government continues to lay the blame on everybody else and anything else to avoid taking responsibility for their own failures. As was discussed in great detail, in the early hours of this morning, the previous coalition government had reduced emissions by 20 per cent on our 2005 base level and put Australia on track to beat our Paris Treaty commitments. The previous coalition government had met and exceeded Australia's Kyoto targets. The previous coalition government had committed to net zero targets by 2050 while working to ensure the energy security of Australians, delivering cheap and reliable baseload power to reach a cleaner future, while also ensuring Australia remains strong, prosperous and independent. So please, can the government please stop providing all these grandioso plans and can the Australian people see action to reduce reduce their electricity and power prices. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. I think um, it's fair to say uh, that the very late sitting that we had last night, thanks to the filibustering by those opposite um, till four o'clock this morning, clearly is an indication about the quality of questions, the quality uh, of questions Senator that Senator we McGrath. have from those opposite. Excuse me. Uh, Senator McGrath has a point of order. A point of order, Act, uh, the Deputy President. Um, the coalition was not filibustering last night. I would ask that Senator Coney withdraw that, outrageful, uh, that outrageous and hurtful allegation. Well, I'm not sure it gets to outrageous or hurtful, but it's up to Senator Ciccone, But he will reflect on his language oh, if he doesn't feel like As always, thought. Deputy President, I mean, I, I don't intend to hurt anyone, but certainly filibustering is an accurate description. But regardless, um, my, my point is the questions, the quality of the questions that we had today in question time by those opposite, uh, you'd expect from some others, predominantly in the crossbench, I must say, with the greatest respects to them, but the quality of the questions that we had from the coalition today were quite outrageous. You know, the fact that we had ministers after minister providing answers to questions that were put to them, particularly around inflation, around the cost of living and spending, but then the responses that we get from them today, from the coalition centres today, it's just ignoring the fact that this government, it been in power for less than one year, has had a hell of a job of trying to fix up the mess of the last decade since you've been in. So to be clear, and I'll, it's always important to put facts on the table. And I know those opposite, particularly you know, some of my favourite senators there, three of them, that love facts on the table. So my first question is, who racked up a trillion dollars of debt, Deputy President? Who racked up a trillion dollars of debt and had nothing to show of it? The coalition. The coalition. Who had a spike in power prices and didn't even tell voters about it? that did not even tell voters about it just before the last federal election. It was the coalition deputy president. And who spent almost a decade deliberately putting pressure down on wages growth? Who? The coalition. The coalition. And also, senators, who also spent almost a decade of actually telling the automotive industry to go away and not invest in domestic manufacturing here in Australia. That's right, Senator Chisholm, the coalition. So now that the Australian people have decided, well, actually, we want a change of government. 
We're now voting for a Labor government, an Albanese Labor government, that is investing in health and education and in jobs and making sure our sovereign capability gets back up to scratch. Now that the Australian people have made that choice, those opposite come in here every single day that we sit here and lecture us, lecture the government about how why we are trying to clear up their mess and try to pretend that their mess never existed. They always are embarrassed about the problems that they created and don't want to take ownership over it. But yes, it is the case and a very much a fact that we were here till very late like this morning, 4.15 to be precise, listening to the contributions by those opposites on a number of bills that we had before this parliament. And it is also you know, a tip for those opposite, particularly the uh, national and liberal colleagues, you know, being in opposition is hard. I understand that. It is always hard being on the losing side. I get that. I was there for three years, but I learnt a lot. I learnt a lot. And by learning a lot, I'm now on this side of the chamber with my lovely colleagues implementing reforms and changes in the interests of working people. And as a senator, I value working with everyone across the chamber, as you would all know. So I think it's actually much healthier for democracies, for parliaments, for chambers like this Senate, when we are actually all working together in the national interest, rather than this sort of short-term political point scoring that we see by those opposite. But the coalition makes it very, very difficult because I suspect when they get up every morning, go to their tactics and say, right, how are we going to say no to Labor's policy for reforms? How are we going to say no to make the, work, the lives of working people better. Their strategy, their tactics must be fascinating because you're having to deal with not only those on the sensible centre but then on those on the fringes who are constantly against, constantly against the interests of working people. So it is clear. How is it that when this government comes into this place, has an approach how do we work with senators? Well, I hate to say it to those opposite, the only common sense that we get in the moment is from the crossbench, who are willing to sit down and work with the government to tackle the cost of living issues, to, co to, to tackle the investments in manufacturing and, in, and also investing in the very people that elected us in this great place. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Deputy President. And um, in, in joining this very um, illustrative um, and quite deep philosophical debate, I, I would like to contribute by, by observing that the answers that were given by, by the ministers to the questions asked by, by my coalition colleagues uh, were characterised by their, their lack of detail and their lack of information and, and quite frankly, by just not answering the questions at all. And if, if anything, question time today was a caricature of the government of Australia that we have at the moment. A, a government that is tricky, a government that is, that is not fulsome with the truth, if I'm allowed to say that, a Deputy President. Uh, and and, and I, I will take the interjection um, from Senator Dunham, a, a government who, who run from accountability and run from transparency. And, and if I may, and, and Senator Ciccone uh, touched upon the, the very important debate that started last night in relation to, to the, the, the government bill on, on, on safeguarding. And it is disappointing. It is actually quite sad that, that the journalists and, and people in this building were not able to hear my contribution uh, at three o'clock this morning, uh, because it was a very good contribution, if I may say myself. But this, this, is what, this is what this government is about. They're using the guillotine like, like mad members of, of, of revolutionary France. Uh, and they're guillotining everything because they don't want transparency and they don't want accountability. And they do not want the opposition to be able to use, to use this chamber as the appropriate mechanism in which to analyse and which to, to discuss our views our views on, on, on a very, very um, challenging piece of legislation. So it was disappointing that, that members of the Liberal National Parties were forced to give their speeches 
beyond the witching hour. And that is sad, but it shows the arrogance of this government, who will do dirty deals in the dark, dirty deals behind closed doors, dirty deals done behind closed doors with, with, with darkened windows, in relation, in relation to the, the governance of this country, but also the management of, of, of this chamber. And what is particularly disappointing about Question Time today and the debate last night is the number one issue in Australia at the moment is cost of living. And, and the Labor Party and the coalition partners, the Greens, fail to appreciate how cost of living is hurting Australians. And their solution, their solution, Deputy President, is not just a new tax, carbon, carbon tax 2.0. It is a giant throbbing tax, a massive tax that they're going to pick up in their hands and chase after every Australian and every Australian family and whack them over the heads. What we've seen from this government is they're giving a giant wedgie to Australians through their secret deals with the Greens. And that is wrong. That is wrong that they would treat Australians so poorly. It is wrong that they would treat this chamber so poorly when it comes to allowing opposition members to question, giant to, to question not giant wedgies, because uh, that's what the Labor Party, so that's what uh, the government is doing to Australians, is giving everybody a giant wedgie. But what, but what they're failing to do is the wedgie that is coming with people's power bills. This government promised before the last election 97 times that they would cut your power bills by $275. 97 times. So it wasn't with, with the Prime Minister you know, had a, a verbal burp and accidentally said something. This was a deliberate tactic. They get into power and instead of cutting your bills by $275, what, what the October budget showed was that power bills are going to go up by 56 per cent over the coming, the coming months. This, this is the modern Labor Party. This is the modern Labor Party who, who talk about the, uh, the light on the hill, but guess what? There is no light on the hill because people can't afford the power bill to pay for the light on the hill. This is how the modern Labor Party have sold out working Australians, have sold out businesses across Australia. And this is why we will spend every day and every hour and every minute making sure that you owned what happened last night and this morning in this chamber. Thank you, Senator McGrath. I'll put the question. Those the questions say aye against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. I rise to take note of, the, of Minister Watt's response to my questions. Thank you. Every week I hear heartbreaking stories about students struggling to put food on the table, to pay for medication, to afford a train or a bus ticket, to pay bills. Week after week, students who are already battling to pay their rent are being hit with rent increases from greedy landlords. Students are working multiple jobs, cutting back on necessities, and still barely scraping by. We hear about the severe financial stress and mental and physical toll that these daily pressures are taking on students. One 19-year-old QUT student says she hasn't eat, eaten fresh fruit and vegetables for at least a month and relies on instant noodles. She struggles to afford period products. At UNSW, hundreds of students are lining up in queues for free food. Students are trying their best, but they still can't make ends meet. And this government is effectively telling them, we can't afford to support you, but you won't believe what we can afford for the wealthy. $254 billion in tax cuts. This is a government that has turned their back on young people and students. I can't remember a time when students were doing it this tough. And it should be clear to anyone with a conscience how difficult it is to be a student at this point in time. People are electing Labour governments because they desperately want change. But Labour is looking away. Labour could choose to raise the rate of income support payments to $88 a day and lift students out of poverty. Labour plays the big game on housing, but Labour's housing bill does nothing for renters, and it will see the shortage of affordable and social housing actually grow. Labor could take immediate steps to relieve the burden of student debt by freezing indexation and raising the minimum repayment income. Student debt is already locking people out of the housing market, stopping them from getting married or starting a family, 
and crushing dreams of further study. Student debt is stopping young people from living the carefree, fun lives that all young people should live. It's stopping them from enjoying university, from, pursu from, from pursuing hobbies, socializing with friends, and just having a good life. Student debt is having a disproportionate impact on women because they earn less and they have more debt. And it will get much worse in June when student debts are set to be indexed by 7%. Millions of Australians will be hit with more debt. They can't keep up because student debts are now going up faster than they can be paid off. So many people have spoken about rising student debt, and I want to read out some of what they've said. I often wonder how long it will take me to pay off my debt. My husband and I are barely able to keep up with the rising cost of living. Abolishing indexation, at the very least, would help lessen the pressure of living expenses and help me catch up with paying off this burdensome debt. Another one says, I doubt I will be able to keep up with, this, with the indexation. Mostly, I just feel stupid for believing what I was told as a child, that I needed to go to uni for a good job, only to end up with a debt that goes up by $2,500 a year. And another one says, now we are seeing nothing but increase, increase, increase. With those increases, they don't understand that it, is not only, it not only affects physical health, it removes resources and access to so much, and it stigmatizes low socioeconomic students. Despite this, the government is sitting on its hands and saying it won't do anything because the university accords process is underway. Well, that's not good enough. This process and its implementation will take years. People are struggling now and they need relief now. This government can abolish indexation and raise income support payments. We have a progressive parliament right here, and that will wave through these measures to support students. Labor is actively choosing not to provide support for those struggling the most, but can give $254 billion to the wealthy in tax cut and commit to another $368 billion on nuclear attack submarines. These choices make it clear that when it comes to substance, we still have a neoliberal government which chooses austerity for people and the planet and abundance for billionaires and the war machine. Be better, Labour. I put the question, those of the questions say aye, against no, the ayes have it.